Good morning, everybody. My name is Dennis Graven, and I am with the uh, NC State um, Extension Wake County um, Master Gardener Volunteer Program. And today we're going to be talking about attracting pollinators to your garden. Um, and so I, I think you'll have a few things to learn, but I want to make certain that you understand that I am a volunteer. I am not a horticulturalist. Um, my expertise is in diagnostic medicine. I spent 42 years working in a hospital. Um, but nonetheless, I've had some training and some experience, and I think I have a few things to share with you. Um, but Mr. Glenn over here is a horticulturalist, and if there are any really horticultural type questions, I might defer to his expertise. I like to tell people that, you know, what I know is a drop when I don't know is an ocean. But I hope that that, that drop will be something that I could share with all of you, and you could all take away a thing or two to learn about attracting pollinators to our, our garden. Now, Chris had com made comment about attracting insects. We're gonna be talking about insects, um, butterflies and, and bees in particular, but also other creatures like hummingbirds, which um, are also pollinators. So let's get to it. All right. <clears throat> so pollinators, um, hummingbirds, butterflies and bees. So <clears throat> um, a, a bit of interesting information, I think, is what most people don't understand how critical Pollinator, pollinators are to our economy and to your food supply. Approximately a third, if everything you eat in terms of vegetable matter requires pollination. Um, that's, that's a huge chunk of what we eat. Um, and pollinators are very important to a lot of industries like the um, apple industry and other food growers um, that need to have a certain productivity from, from their, um, their orchards. Um, and as mo most folks know that um, uh, the uh, orchard growers will bring in uh, large numbers of beehives to pollinate their trees so they get the productivity that they need to have out of them. Without the pollinators, they would get either very little um, or productivity out of the trees or certainly not the maximum amount. All right. So when we're going to be talking about pollinators, one of the things we need to know is, well, how do you protect them? Because um, pollinators are under threat um, everywhere these days globally. Uh, the insect population has dropped dramatically in the last couple of de decades. So what can you do to help protect pollinators and attract them to your garden? All right. So we're going to be talking and mention this particular topic, the very first line here a lot. It's the issue of native plants. <clears throat> so the local pollinators, the insects, the hummingbirds, um, and other pollinators, um, uh, ants and other such things, um, have evolved uh, along with other species here through the millennia. Um, and so when you have a native plant, <clears throat> the um, proteins, the, the, the pollen and the nectar the, that they get um, um, their carbohydrates from are specific to the kinds of insects and their physiology that exist in this region. A lot of people will plant um, flowers in particular and other um, types of plants that are non-native, largely because they look so good. Um, because they may look good to you, they may not be the best source of nutrition um, to the, the local pollinator. So planting something that is native is, a, is an important issue. And there are other reasons why well, you might wanna do that. And we'll talk about that as we move on. So <clears throat> you wanna increase the number of flowering plants that you have in your landscape. Um, I do some presentations on um, turf grass as well. And most people that are into turf grass um, want their turf grass to look pretty much like turf grass and nothing else. One of the things I like to remind people of is that when you have a beautiful lawn that uh, is impressive from a turf graph, man turf graph management point of view, that what you have essentially is a green desert because you don't want anything else there. Anything else that might be there, you might consider to be a pest, like let's say a weed. Um, now you might call it a weed, um, but other people might call it a wildflower. But if there's dandelions in your garden, in your lawn, um, that's a great attract a, um, um, flower to attract. Um, it's a native plant, it's a great uh, um, bloom to attract native bees, but it's not what you want in your garden. So you don't want any insects in your garden. You don't want any other um, plants growing in your garden. You want in your lawn, you just want your turf grass. So consider, restricting your area of turf grass 
and putting in some natural areas where you could plant more flowers and have less lawn. It's easier to maintain, cost you less, and you could contribute um, to um, having um, an attractive um, landscape that will attract pollinators to your garden. Um, you want to also consider um, having nesting sites, um, places for the um, insects to have refuge during the night, during high winds, during rainstorms, where are they going to go? So you want to be able to have a place um, that they can nest. And of course, we'll talk more about this issue as well. You want to use pesticides sparingly, if at all. All right, now, if you're going to use insecticides, be mindful when you do that. So the very first thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that you use the correct pesticide for what your situation is. Let's start with the word pesticide. That covers a lot of territory. Typically, if you want to control insects, you're going to use a pesticide referred to as an insecticide. There are, of course, other things, herbicides and fungicides and other sorts of things that you use to control pests. So you want to be sure that you identify whatever your problem is and select the proper pesticide. One of the things we get a lot as master gardeners is people will find some problem with their plant. They're not really sure what's wrong with it. But as a general rule of thumb, they'll do one of three things. They'll put some fertilizer on it, they'll water it, and they'll spray it with something, okay? Um, because it just seems the natural thing to do. Um, and that oftentimes does not solve their problem because their problem had nothing to do with being underwatered um, or needing fertilizer or needing an insecticide. So you wanna start with trying to figure out what exactly is your problem. So you'll be looking for things like, are, are there any signs that there's an insect um, on your plants? And is there any damage from that insect? Um, if you can't see the insect itself, are there any insect eggs? Or is there any insect frass, the droppings of, of insects? Look for signs of insects, because whatever problem you might have may not be caused by um, some biotic agent like an insect. It could be an abiotic problem. You could have sun scald, for instance, or your problem could be that you've overwatered your plants, um, or the problem could be that your next door neighbor had a lawn service that came in, they weren't very skilled at what they were doing and they sprayed on a windy day and some of the overspray infiltrated into your garden and is affecting your plants, okay? So you could have uh, chemical damage to your plants. So you wanna start off with making sure you spend enough time to figure out exactly what your problem is so you can use the proper pesticide. <laughs> um, you wanna avoid spraying any kind of insecticide on any of your flowers while they're in bloom. And that should be fairly obvious. You have the plants there to bloom to attract um, the pollinators. You certainly don't want to apply any pesticides during that period of time. Um, you might also want to consider when you're having your garden, um, uh, in particular, if you like to grow vegetables, that you want to put your flowering plants in one place and your vegetables in a different place so that if you do have to spray your, your vegetables, you don't get overspray from your vegetables onto your flowers. So you wanna think your way through that a little bit too. This next uh, bullet point here um, is, uh, is an issue I wanna spend a little bit of time on. So if you spray a plant, and we get this a lot from people who spray for, for mosquitoes, um, where they'll use a spray and they'll tell you it's, it's pollinator safe. And it, and it is in the sense that they're oftentimes they use a, a, um, a, a um, pesticide called pyrethrum um, and they spray it on your, your shrubbery. And in particular, if your shrubbery is not producing any flowers, it's, during, it's, it's in your shrubbery where the mosquitoes will rest and, and take shelter. But your bees and the other pollinators rarely go to where um, there are no flowers. There's no reason for them to go there. Um, so unless you have a situation where a storm comes up and you have a pollinator, you have some bees and they've got no place to shelter. And if they go to where your shrubs are and if you've got um, insecticide sprayed to control your mosquitoes, you may do damage to your pollinators as well. So keep that in mind too. <clears throat> 
So there's a lot of, of threats to pollinators that we have. Um, loss of habitat and forest clearing for all sorts of reasons. Um, and the pollution and rainwater um, issues that we have. Um, and um, one of the things that I wanna be sure that you understand is that when you are applying um, any kind of fertilizer or pesticide to your garden, that you carefully read the instructions. That's the other thing we see happen a lot um, in the public is that um, people aren't very careful as to how they use the various products. They don't read the instructions very carefully. Um, and so if you need a pound of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet, um, they're not real careful about measuring out exactly what 1,000 square feet is in one pound. Or if you need four ounces per gallon of a pesticide, yeah, it's six ounces per gallon will make it just a little bit better. Well, the problem with that is when you overapply apply, um, fertilizers and pesticides to your garden more than what you need, then you're going to get more runoff into the water um, and, 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 and more of pollution um, to surrounding areas. A surprising amount of, of, of pollution comes from individual homeowners because they're casual about it. Big agricultural operations um, oftentimes run on thin margins. So when you're applying um, chemicals, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, whatever it might be to hundreds, if not thousands of acres, um, that can get real expensive pretty quickly. So the commercial growers have an incentive to make sure they use the right product with the right amount, because otherwise they're just throwing money down the drain. So the amount of, of, of um, uh, pollution coming from the commercial growers tends to be less when it's adjusted for the volumes of the things that they're growing. So per plant or per for hectare or however you want to measure a unit volume, oftentimes we get the casual use of these chemicals by homeowners um, being much more of a problem. So that's something I, I would like to ask you to be careful about. All right. All right. So how do we welcome pollinators? These three issues. If I hope there's nothing else that you take back from this lecture, these three issues are something to consider. You want to be able to make sure they have proper shelter. You want to make sure that they have water and food. All right. Now, <clears throat> All right. All right. So the pollinators don't go to the plants for the purpose of pollinating the plant, right? That's, an, that's a side effect, an after effect. They're there to collect pollen and nectar, all right? Pollen basically is a protein, nectar is a carbohydrate, all right? Native plants are most attractive, as we had talked earlier. Um, um, because the, um, the insects have uh, evolved to those native plants. When you bring in um, plants that aren't native, there's a couple of things that happen. Um, oftentimes those plants and the flowers that they produce are there because they are attracted to you. They look good to you. Um, so they may not be the kind of plant that the pollinator is gonna find very useful because they may not be able to get to the, to the um, uh, pollen and to the nectar because of the structure of the plant itself, right? It's not something they had evolved to. And then even if they can, there are all sorts of proteins and all sorts of carbohydrates in the plants themselves. So just like, you know, there's a difference when you eat um, a carbohydrate from a refined sugar, or when you get your carbohydrate from a fresh zucchini, all right? Um, so the improper carbohydrate or protein to, to the insect coming from a non-native plant might be like junk food to the, to the insect. It may not, it may provide them the carbohydrate they crave, but it might not um, provide a balanced meal for them. And they wind up then being um, nutritionally compromised. And when they're nutritionally compromised, then they suffer from all sorts of other issues. They're more prone to disease. They're more prone to um, uh, fatigue. They're more prone to um, being um, uh, parasitized. They have all sorts of issues. So you wanna keep the bees healthy and to keep the bees and pollinators healthy. They need to have a good diet, just like you do. <clears throat> all right. So if you're planning your pollinator garden, you wanna do it with some forethought. 
And so ideally you would have been planning your, your pollinator garden, garden last fall where you have some time to sort of sketch things out, but it's not too late to start now as well. You want to take, start off by getting a soil test. One of the reasons you want to have a soil test is because depending upon what you're going to plant, you want your plants to be healthy as well. Um, and to do that, you may have to be certain that whatever soil you have is going to support the growth of the plant that you intend to, to propagate. Um, so you want to start there to make sure you have the proper pH and the proper nutrients in the soil um, that will provide for a healthy plant. Having a healthy plant and helping a native plant um, is um, one of the very first steps that you want to, to be able to um, employ uh, here in your pollinator garden um, so that if the plant is healthy and it's attracting the, the proper insects, insects that they have evolved with, the entire ecosystem stays healthy. So if the plant itself is unhealthy because the pH is off or because it's overwatered or because it doesn't get enough sunshine, or because it's over fertilized, um, then it's gonna be more susceptible to insect damage. And then you're more likely to say, well, you know, my plant is suffering from insect damage, let me spray something with it on it, where, the, where basically what the plant needs is proper management of the soil um, and uh, care of the plant itself without having to apply um, uh, an insecticide. Um, so you wanna sketch out your garden, you wanna come out with the plan, where are you gonna put your pollinating uh, flowers, your, your, your blooms? Where are you gonna put things that don't bloom? Where are you gonna have um, um, basking areas? Uh, where are you gonna have sources of water? You wanna plan all of that out. This is a great time of the year to start planting early spring. So um, if you have a plan, or you have an idea as to what you wanna do, now's a good time um, to start um, your planting. All right, so let's talk a little bit about butterflies. All right, so, all right, so most of the bullet points here we've already talked about. Again, we keep getting back to you want to have native plants for your native butterflies. Exotic plants um, cause all sorts of issues with, with the um, pollinators and they, in addition to being particularly um, uh, aggressive with their growth as with kudzu, for instance, there are all sorts of things. Or, you know, if you look around here, Raleigh, we see um, the, um, uh, the Chinese wisteria taking over everywhere. Um, Confederate jasmine is very invasive. So, you know, if, if, if you want to grow a, um, a jasmine, you select a Carolina jasmine, a, 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 a native plant versus um, some um, exotic species, if you want to attract your pollinators. <laughs> um, even though the ornamental plants, the um, um, the more aggressive plants um, tend to look very, very nice to you. They don't provide the nectar um, and they don't provide the pollen that the insects need. All right. So while you're trying to sketch out what it is that you want to be able to do um, to attract your, your pollinators, keep in mind that you want to be able to use different types of flowers um, and you want to spread them out through the season. So you want to have early bloomers, mid-season bloomers, late-season bloomers, um, and you want to be able to have um, uh, different clusters of plants. So you don't, instead of having single plants, single blooming plant, plants here and there, you put clusters of plants. All right. Here's an issue that a lot of people are unaware of. Most insects can't drink from open water. So you wanna have food, water, and shelter. Well, one of the ways you get water um, to uh, an insect or a butterfly into a, um, a bee in particular, is to have some sort of arrangement is that shown here in this picture where you have a, a um, tray from a, a container um, and you fill that with mud or sand and you put some sticks or some flat stones to act, act as perches and you keep that moist because then the insects will pick up the moisture from the moist sand or the mud, okay? Because if you just put a bowl of water out there or put like a bird bath, that won't help them any. And in particular, if you're trying to attract mason bees, you, you wanna use mud because mason bees 
by their, as you might expect from uh, their, um, their name, use mud to, to um, make their nests. Kind of like carpenter bees, you know, <laughs> you, uh, bore holes in wood, mason bees use mud to make their nests into hollows. All right. All right, hummingbirds. So although there are a lot of hummingbirds in, in America, there's only one species of hummingbird um, that we, we have here um, in, in the Raleigh area, uh, ruby-throated hummingbirds. And, and I think the next slide shows that. But you can make your own hummingbird um, uh, food to attract the hummingbirds, four parts water, one part sugar. With this one caveat, be sure that when you do that, you change the fluid very frequently in your feeders. What you do not want to have happen is have that um, sugar solution, especially during the warm season where it's outside and the sun is shining on it, for it to start to ferment or for it to get moldy. It typically gets moldy very quickly. And it's very unhealthy for the hummingbirds to be feeding off of a mold infested um, food source. As a matter of fact, oftentimes they'll just avoid it if it gets too um, moldy. So clean it out. Um, I, I, I recommend every four or five days, no, no longer that. Well, at least keep an eye on it. Make sure that there's no mold on it. And then when you, when you flush it out, flush it with a 10% um, bleach solution to kill any mold that might be there if you have a molded, moldy situation. Um, then rinse that out very well and then restock the, um, the, the, the mixture. What I typically do is whatever my hummingbird feeder will hold, I won't put any more than a third or a half um, in the container because what I want is to have it all gone. And so if you fill it all up and they only drink half of it and then the rest of it goes moldy, well, you know, then that's a problem. So you might need to you know, gauge that in your own garden, depending upon how, how many hummingbirds you have uh, visiting your site. So if you put a whole cup of, of, um, of food in your hummingbird feeder and they eat that up in three days, then maybe you could put two cups up. You, you just have to decide on your own what your um, usage rate is. All right, so ruby throated hummingbirds. Um, um, that's the only species here that breeds in our area. Um, the hummingbird um, nest or cup nest, I don't know if anyone's ever seen those, but they're really rather interesting. If you'll, sometimes you'll see them in dogwood trees and, and other sorts of things, um, but, they're, but they're real teeny. So if you find a tiny itty bitty um, old cup nest, then it's gonna be a hummingbird nest. Now, <clears throat> Another thing that a lot of people seem to miss is that hummingbirds eat things other than just nectar from flowers or from your bird feeder. They also eat small insects like those mosquitoes that we were talking about. Um, so, and here's the discussion of the kinds of flowers I like to have. I mentioned Carolina jasmine instead of the Confederate jasmine. Um, um, All right, I think that slide sort of speaks for itself. Well, I want to mention one other thing here about insects. So, um, no, I, I'm going to wait until we get to a slide that's called integrated pest management to talk about that. Hopefully, I won't forget the pot that thought when I when we get there. Okay. All right. Now, not being a horticulturalist, I'm not really sure I could identify these uh, plants. I think we've got um, some lantana there. Um, looks like goldenrod to me, but these are just some photographs of some plants um, that hummingbirds are attracted to. Now, what it was, can I go back? Pretty sure. Okay, so lantana on the top left, I think that's bignonia on the top right, uh, cross vine. Okay. And then of course, goldenrod is Dennis okay. said in the bottom left and Monarda on the bottom right. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay. All right, let's talk about bees. All right. All right, so we already made mention that, that uh, bees are very um, important to pollination. Bees are very efficient pollinators. Um, in particular, uh, the most efficient pollinator, it would be a mason bee um, because um, their range of, of um, motion or their range of, of, of um, travel would be the better term for it is only about 300 feet, whereas a, um, a 
bumblebee or a humming or um, a honeybee will travel much longer distances. Okay. Um, now, native bees, this, there's a, an error here in this slide. It lists the various kinds of bees that we have here, and it lists honeybees as a native bee. Honeybees are not native to North Carolina. Honeybees are not native to North America, let alone um, North Carolina. They're all brought over from Europe. Yet when people think of bees, the first thing that they think of is a, is a honeybee as, as a pollinator. They are not native. Um, and they are not the, the best pollinator um, in, in terms of bee populations. All right, now, so most of the native bees that we have here are not very aggressive at all. Um, they are either solitary or they live in small colonies. And lots of times those colonies are either in the ground or they're in small hollows. Now it's important to know this um, because it's not that uncommon for someone to come across a, some ground bees, bees, not yellow jackets, but bees, and be concerned that they have bees in their backyard and the first thing they want to do is kill them. Um, bad idea if you want to attract pollinators to your garden. If you have ground uh, nesting bees in a colony, just let them be, let them be through their nesting season. Don't disturb them. Native bees, solitary and living in small colonies are not very aggressive for this reason. Compared to honeybees, honeybees live in large hives where there are thousands, tens of thousands of individuals. And all of the individuals that live in a honeybee hive are all sisters, okay? They're all sisters. Well, they have some brothers too, but they don't do one heck of a whole lot other than one thing and then they get rid of them. So um, the, all of the workers, all of the, the, the honeybees that are performing any honeybee functions are all sisters because they all come from one queen. And even the queen is somewhat of a mis misnomer. She's not a monarch. She's not a ruler. She's an ovary. All she does is produce eggs. Okay, um, and of course, um, she, she only breeds once and then she produces the same set of related sisters over and over and over again. And if she breeds another time, they're still stepsisters. They're all real genetically related and there's thousands of them. The next thing is they have division of labor. So in a beehive, you have some bees that do nothing but forage or predominantly forage. You have some bees that, um, take care of the larvae. You have some bees that, that protect the, the, the hives. You have some bees that tend to the queen. The, the, everyone has a different job, right? Um, so when you have division of labor like that, and you've got tens of thousands of individuals, it's no big deal if one of them sacrifices their life for the greater good. So honeybees are not that particularly aggressive either, but they will sting you um, if you provoke them. Now, native bees that are singular, you have to appreciate this. So if you have a mason bee and she's already been fertilized, there's only one bee that's just her. She has to do everything, right? She has to find the proper mate. She has to find the proper nesting site. She has to build the nest. She has to lay the eggs. She has to protect the eggs. She has to make sure they're hatched. She has to do all those things by herself. So she can't afford to be too aggressive. If she's aggressive and she loses the battle, then she loses her entire brood. So there's little incentive for um, a ground bee or um, a, a bee that nests in a hollow like mason bees do um, to be aggressive to you at all. Now, I hear this a lot too. And soon you will see the carpenter bees coming out and you'll be sworn, there'll be swarming bees um, who act in a very aggressive fashion. Those are always the males of, of that particular species of the carpenter bees. The males are very aggressive because they're trying to establish a territory um, to mate with the females. They're the first to hatch and to establish their dominance. So they tend to act in a very aggressive manner, but it's just one thing, they can't sting. So most of their posturing is just that, it's posturing. And if you're interested in a little particular 
tidbit of information. One way you could tell the difference between the male carpenter bee and the female carpenter bee is the male carpenter bee has a little white dot in the middle of its forehead. And it's big enough and the bee is big enough that when they're buzzing right in front of your face, you could see that white dot and you know it's a male. And so if you're a grandfather and you have nine grandchildren, and some of them are little boys or even little girls, and you want to impress the heck out of them, you could just snatch one of those things out of the air and hand it to them. And your grandchildren think you've got superpowers, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. It's just that you want to be absolutely certain they got that little white dot on their head because I don't want you to tell you how I know from personal experience, but if you make a mistake and you snatch one out of the air and it's a female, then you don't look so cool in the face of your grandchildren anymore when you're jumping around because you just got stung. All right, so the point is, when you come across native bees, even carpenter bees, I know they do a lot of damage, but just to kill them for the sake of killing them is not a real good idea, okay? That's probably what we're trying to get across to you here. The um, nesting sites is another issue I wanna make mention of. The, the mason bees nest in a hollow, like in ornamental grasses. So what, uh, or you could even get, um, uh, uh, nests made, uh, bee houses, bee nests made specifically for carpenter bees where you have like little hollowed out pieces of bamboo. You can find them in almost all the big box stores or you could get a block of wood and drill holes in it of about three eighths of an inch of in diameter and put that out in the garden um, to attract the uh, mason bees with some moisture and some mud to attract them. But oftentimes in, in, in the wild, they'll nest in things like tall grasses. So when you have ornamental grasses, what a lot of people do is when they start to turn brown in the fall into the winter, they go and cut them down at the ground level. Well, if you do that, and if there are any nesting bees in there, you've just taken the nest and thrown them away. So what we would recommend is if you have that kind of ornamental grass in your garden, let it stay through the spring. Let the bees hatch and go about doing their bee business and then cut them down, cut the dead growth down, being careful, um, not to cut off the new growth as it's coming up. Typically, if you cut them down you know, six inches or so above the ground level, above the crown of the plant, you should be fine. But be mindful when you're doing that, that you're not cutting off the, the, um, the new growth as it's coming up. Let the grass stay there so that the bees could, could hatch and, and, and reproduce. Okay. All right. So the bees visit the flowers for food. Um, not to, to pollinate them, that they're there for food for the bees. All right. Um, the bees use the uh, protein to make what they call bee bread. That's what they feed to their, to their larva. Um, and of course, carbohydrates they use for energy just as you do. All right. So this slide is again, pretty straightforward. You can read that yourself. Um, I think it's pretty well known that we are seeing a real threat to our pollinators, um, even though the numbers of uh, honeybee colonies has dropped dramatically, the amount of, of, of um, farmland that needs them has been increasing because our population has been increasing. All right, so we see um, these sorts of threats um, to the bee populations, parasites, disease, pesticides, as we've already mentioned, the poor nutrition and habitat loss. Um, so back to the idea of making sure that you have the, the, the proper kinds of plants so that you have a proper kind of nutrition so you have a healthy bee. And if the bee is healthy, they're gonna be more resistant to diseases and parasites and other threats to their, um, to their being. All right, so integrated pest management. We wanna talk about this for, but I mentioned a moment ago when I was gonna say something about using pesticides. So I think I'll talk about that now. Um, so there was the slide earlier talked about using um, natural um, versus chemically produced um, uh, um, insecticides. And we hear a lot about this. So people will think that if I use something natural, something like um, BT or pyrethrin or, or, or neem oil or, or anything like that, that it's safe to use for bee populations. And it is not, okay? Just because it's a natural product does not necessarily mean it's going to be um, any less toxic to the bees. Um, 
you know, anyone could have a conversation with Socrates and, and ask him what he thinks about drinking hemlock. Hemlock is perfectly natural, but if you drink too much of that, it's going to put an end to you, as natural as it might be. So uh, talking about using the proper kind of insecticide for the proper uh, plant for the proper insect is very important. So yeah, BT, but diet pill. A lot of people are familiar with that, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacterium. It's a bacterium that... Um, um, that irritates the lining of the larval form of insects. So the, the caterpillar um, is eating um, your kale or your cabbage or your collards. Uh, you put this BT, this bacterium on those plants, um, and then it infects the, the caterpillar and it irritates their stomach lining, their GI tract, and it kills them. So you figure, well, you got an adult bee, they're not a larval form, they're safe. You don't have to worry about it. No. <laughs> Keep in mind that this is a bacterium, and by definition, it's a very little. And so if the bee comes in contact with, with the BT, the Bacillus thuringiensis, the dipil, all that bacteria will be attracted to their, to their hairs and their body, just like the pollen is. And so when they go back to the hive, and then they expose the other bees to that, to that bacteria, and if some of those bees are the bees that are taking care of the larval forms, it's going to transfer from the adult bees to the larval forms and kill them too. So be mindful of the kinds of products you use, that just because it's a natural product does not necessarily mean it's safe. You still have to use them like you use any other insecticide, okay? All right, now, seek balance, not eradication. And here's the point that I wanna make about insects. So <clears throat> you look at your plant and you got some insects on it. What are you supposed to do? Well, <laughs> if it's a native plant, and if you have insects on it and you have some damage, one of the things that you might do is just say, let it go, right? That plant and those insects have been here for millennia. They have already evolved and developed to the point that they seek a natural balance. They're ecologically balanced. So the insects may do some damage, but not enough to damage the plant. Damage to the plant do they um, threaten the life of the plant, right? So if you don't apply any insecticide whatsoever, they'll probably be just fine. Keep an eye on it. Have some tolerance for the presence of a little bit of insects. Now, here's another thing. <clears throat> that insect is a pest to you, but it's a food source to other creatures, like let's say songbirds, okay? Um, Eastern bluebirds or, or chickadees uh, or any kind of songbird. A lot of songbirds um, um, eat either insects or exclusively or during the spring when they're feeding their young, they may be seed feeders like finches, but when they're feeding their young, they feed them insects. So here's another little trivia question. It, it, most people know what a chickadee is. It's a tiny itty bitty bird about the size of your thumb. It's not very big at all. Chickadees typically will, will have um, one or two um, broods each year, and each brood is about four eggs, and, and the little um, chicks are tiny, about the size of the tip of your finger. So they're not very big birds. So the question is, how many insects does it take to raise one, one hatching of chickadees? And the answer is 6,000, okay? So when you kill all the insects in your entire garden, you've got your beautiful lawn that you don't want any insects there. You don't want any larval grubs or anything. You don't want your bluebirds to eat those grubs. They're gonna kill them. You don't want insects anywhere. You don't want them on your flowers. You don't want them on your vegetables. What's the natural habitat supposed to eat? What are the birds gonna eat? Now, so keep that in mind too. Leave some of those things there unless they're causing a real problem. And if they're causing a real problem for one plant, and if you've added a lot of diversity, as we talked about earlier, you might just sacrifice the whole plant and have something else that's thriving. So before you start applying chemicals to everything, think your way through that. Okay. All right. So again, here, use natural pesticides when possible with the caveat that I mentioned a moment ago. All right. All right. So, um, you, of course, we already talked a little bit about this. You want to be able to provide nesting sites for and resting sites for your pollinators. 
Um, most of our native plants, um, uh, pollinators, um, I should say, nest in the ground. Some of them nest in hollow stems. Um, please don't disturb them when they're there. Do what you can to preserve them. All right, here's another interesting thing too. Um, so there are various kinds of colors that attract um, um, pollinators. And other than the red for the hummingbirds, if you notice the color red's not on here for, for, hummingbird, for um, butterflies and bees, for whatever reason, they're attracted to other colors, okay? Um, and this fragrance, floral or herbal, a lot of people say, if you plant the flower, what are the kind of fragrance you're gonna get? Well, there's a slide toward the end here, we'll come back to that. So just hold that thought about fragrance because there are other pollinators other than bees and hummingbirds. You want to have various kinds of shapes. Um, you want to have um, flowers that um, grow at different times of the year. Uh, identify dearth times or times where there aren't very many flowers, like right now. So things like um, they're just beginning to bloom. Um, your forsythia and other early bloomers. Um, this is a great time to have um, those sorts of things present for the early bees um, that, that start to come. The bees will come pretty early, much earlier than the butterflies do. And the um, hummingbirds don't come to this area until much later. All right. Now, two bullet points here. Allow your crops um, to bloom. Um, almost all your vegetable crops will bolt when you leave them in the soil long enough. When I plant my vegetable garden, I'm putting in my kale and collards and um, rocket and arugula and other sorts of core of the crops right now in my garden. And so by the time it starts to get warm, they begin to bolt and I take them out and put a succession crop. But if you have, I, mean, I have a very limited space to grow vegetables. If you have the space, if you can, you could just allow those plants to go into seed. As a matter of fact, if they're, if they're um, heirloom plants, you can let them go into seed and harvest the seeds and use them to plant the following year. But when they go to seed, they also will attract um, pollinators. And this the last point here, leave weeds. I'll go about, if you want to have a lawn, well, you know, what kind of lawn do you want to have? What kind of turf grass do you want? Do you want nothing but the turf grass? Or do you want to have some weeds in it? If you think of the weeds as a pest, that's one thing. If you think of the pests uh, as the weeds as a wild flower, then that's another thing. But then again, you have to, you know, you have to contend with your neighbors and your homeowners associations and things like that that might not be very appreciative of the fact that your lawn is all infested with um, henbit and, and dandelion. So if that's not an option available to you, then consider taking out some of your turf grass, especially where you have turf grass that doesn't do well where it's not a lot of light, where it's a lot of moisture on, let's say on the north side of the house or, um, or a very shaded area or where the water um, uh, tends to flow um, um, from one lot to the other. If you're having trouble growing grass there, instead of spending more time and energy to grow more grass, consider taking the grass out and putting in a, 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 um, a, um, a flower garden, something that would attract um, uh, pollinators. It, because that's now in the shade, be careful that the kinds of plants that you are going to select to put in the shade are being plants that could tolerate the shade. So you want to put the right plant in the right place. All right. Um, okay, I think that's most of everything there. All right, so you want to plant masses, clumps, as we talked about earlier. You want to have a different, all different kinds of plants. So have different shapes, different sizes, different colors, different heights. Um, again, we keep coming back to um, uh, native plants. You want to help provide the rocks for the basking sites that we talked about earlier with some moist sand or mud around them. And you want to stagger your, your plants um, so you have different blooms at different seasons. And exactly why we have listed perennials here, I'm not sure annuals do just as well. Make sure that most flowering plants like a lot of light. There are some that will grow in the shade, but most of them like a lot of light. So you wanna have at least six hours of sunlight um, for most of your flowering plants. Okay. So I think most people know what we mean by a native plant. Although even this is a little bit of a, um, 
a misnomer, I guess. What is a native plant? A plant that has grown up here in North Carolina, like since when? Well, typically the line that we draw on the sign, sand when we see native is before European settlement. But keep in mind that there have been people living here for something like, I don't know, 10 to 15,000 years before Europeans ever got here. And people, those people are like, just like you or just like me, they have to live and they have to adapt to their environment and they've amended and altered the landscape for those 10 to 15,000 years. So when you say native, do you mean native before human populations or native before Europeans or when exactly you're talking about? Because if you were to go to this landscape that we're standing on right now here in Raleigh, North Carolina, and go back, well, if you go back 20,000 years, it's still going during the ice age. But you know, if you got here before um, any human populations, the landscape would be dramatically different and the native plants would be dramatically different. People for the longest time have been cultivating plants and amending the landscape to, to encourage sorts of things to grow and to discourage other things to grow. So the landscape has been amended for you know, quite some time. So what exactly is native is a little bit fuzzy around the edges. Okay. All right, so um, here again are some um, examples of native plants. As long as they are, um, are labeled, I'm good. Otherwise, I'll have to ask Chris. This is going to be a butterfly weed. Uh, um, I'm not sure. It's a milkweed. Okay, goldenrod. So some of that um, ornamental grass that I told you about. Um, let's see here. With these long projections here, tend to get hollow. That's what you want to leave through the season. The bladed grass here won't have very many hollows, but these will. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so this is another example of what I'm talking about. Um, so you, oops, go back here. Oh, wait. So this flower, it's a simple old fashioned flower. An old fashioned flower has everything right here that the bee needs there and here. You start to get something that's a little bit more complicated than this. And it's hard for the pollinator to get to the things that they need to get to the stamens and the pistils and stuff where all the nectar and pollen is. So when you get the fancy flowers that have a whole, a whole column of, of petals, again, it's pleasing to the eye, but not very pleasing to the insects um, that are trying to, to pollinate. Um, is that bull thistle, Chris? What do we have here? So Rebecca in the background, what's this one for? Uh, that one I don't know. I don't think it's a thistle. You don't think it's a thistle? Okay. Um, um, Aster. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's the word I was searching for. So you have a monarch butterfly, the overwhelming probability of that is a milkweed. Uh, Joe pieweed. That's Joe pieweed? Yep. Um, can they lay their eggs and eat Joe pieweed? No, but no, that, one, so. that one's getting nectar. Okay, just the nectar, yep. okay. So um, monarch butterflies could only um, use um, milkweed um, as a, a source of food. More examples of different kinds of flowers and you see all the different colors, different heights, different distributions all compact together. So a bee could go from one to the other without having to go long distances and, and get fatigued. Echinacea, I have no idea um, what that plant is, but we have another pollinator here that is not typically thought of as a pollinator, um, but it's resting on this more so than it's re um, that's using this as a source of in, uh, feed. Um, that's a, 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 a predator. All right, so we're getting toward the end of the presentation. Just a few other things to keep in mind. So there are other pollinators other than just butterflies, hummingbirds, and bees. We also have ants. Um, anybody who's ever had peonies, you know, the, the ants that have evolved to be with the peonies, um, they're there to protect the, 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 um, the flowers, uh, particularly from aphids. Um, and so if you've got ants on your peonies and you want to be able to bring the peonies in the house, you don't want to spray the peonies to kill the ants. It's not a good idea. They're there for a reason. All right, beetles. Um, this slide, I'm not sure exactly what the heck this is here for. Butterfly wings. 
that one um, uh, is an enigma to me. So we'll skip over that. But this issue, when I mentioned earlier, we have different kinds of aroma that come from flowers, typically the floral or the herbal. But if you've ever smelled a pawpaw blossom, they don't smell very good, right? They're really pretty stinky. And the reason they're stinky is they're there to attract their pollinators, which are flies. So flies could be pollinators too. All right. So here's, um, I'm gonna leave that there for a while. If um, anybody wants to take a, either a picture of that or make some notes, these are some really good resources um, that you could use um, uh, to get more information about attracting pollinators to your garden. I'm gonna leave that there for just a few moments. Okay, all right, need any longer? Nope, got one more back there. Okay, and here are some places you can go to visit, various sites, if you wanna see some pollinator gardens. Okay, and information about the Wake County Extension Master Gardening Program here in Wake County. All right, so with that, I'm happy to answer questions that we might have, if I can. All righty, thank you so much, Dennis. That was awesome as always with the Master Gardener lectures. I'm going to chime in just a little bit because you did cover it just a touch and I made a comment earlier on because uh, I think it's a very important one. Um, a, lo a lot of our plants that we select uh, horticulturally are double and a double flower is made at the expense of the um, anthers and also the, uh, the female parts inside the plant. And of course the anthers are what has the pollen. So um, if you have no uh, anthers in the plant, you're not gonna have an insect visiting it for the pollen. And it's also done at the expense of the nectaries. So if you really are trying to attract pollinators, think twice about many of your doubles. I'm sure there are some doubles out there that are very valid and, and do work out well, but many of the doubles just don't have the nectar or the pollen in them. So you might wanna avoid them. And there's also some plants that come in different colors and they might lose their pattern. A lot of insects will uh, uh, view the plants in the infrared and different spectrums than we see, and the plants look different. So if you have a plant that's supposed to be white, but it comes in red, it's not gonna look right to the insect. They may not even know that it's a flower. So keep that in mind. So as you start selecting your really cool plants that are rare and exotic, the insects may not just know them. The Stokes Aster that Dennis showed in there, that's built properly. That one is made for insects to visit, but you get something like a rose that's really double, that one's gonna confuse the insects and it's just not gonna have the right parts inside of it. So think twice about some of your doubles. And if you want some insects, work on the single ones, like a single rose. They're gonna be loaded in the pollinators coming out and visiting them. So that, that's a, a definitely a consideration right there for it. Do we have any questions here in the audience? Okay, that was a shake our head no. So I think we had at least one question here in the chat that I did not get to. Okay. And I don't know if I'm going to have the answer for it. Um, so let me let me get back to it. Uh, Gertrude asked, um, is the sunflower pawpaw, does that one need a cross pollinator? So mm -hmm. not really on topic for today's presentation. So we don't necessarily have the experts here. Yeah. I'm not an expert in pawpaws and Dennis is shaking no, his no. head no. So uh, Gertrude, read the literature on that one and just see if that one is gonna be a self-fertile um, uh, pawpaw because pawpaws do overall need a cross pollinator. And even for the ones that are recommended that they're not necessary, they often do increase the fruit overall. So even if it doesn't need one, you still might be better off with a friend. Now, Is that I, just how it works in a lot of them? Let me comment here as well. You yep. can go to the NC State Extension off our um, website Okay, um, this is the website here for the Master Gardener program. But if you, if you Google Wake County or, um, NC State Extension Office, uh, they have 
a plethora of information. If you were to, yep. in fact, if you were to, if you simply Google um, pawpaw pollination site colon edu space NC, um, edu is going to get your university in NC will get you North Carolina or something close to North Carolina. That's a good place to go to start getting good information. Now, again, you want to keep something local. So if it's from you know Clemson or from South Carolina or something or Virginia, that's fine. But you don't want to get information from North Michigan Dakota or on North Papa. Dakota, right, yeah. or wherever. It may not be that ill. I'm not sure Papa's even go there. But um, you know, so look for something local. Again, site colon edu space NC. Yep. Um, or go directly to um, the North Carolina NC State Extension. Um, search for that. They also have um, a lot of information on their plant toolbox. So if you Google NC State plant toolbox, you'll find all kinds of information on identifying a plant or selecting a plant for the kind of area that you might want to um, uh, plant something with. Oh, it's a whole bunch of information. I mean, the whole point with this program, the extension office is to take all of the expertise from the university. That's yeah. NC State is, is the land grant college established right after the Civil War. It's here to bring the expertise of the college, of the, of the people who are very well versed PhDs, scientists, and to bring that to the general public. Back during the Civil War period of time and, and before and after that, most farmers didn't go to the university. They just couldn't afford it. So the idea mm -hmm. was how do you get information from the university out to the public. Well, it's evolved into with this kind of a program, we have an extension office. We can bring people who bring to the general public information, try to answer questions, and we don't know the answers to the questions, like this particular question, even if it's off topic, that doesn't make any difference. We could refer you to the best possible science scientifically based information that we have available at this university which is a university of, of, of renown. This is, this is a top-notch university. The people there are astounding at what they know. And every one of them is a specialist. So, you know, uh, mm -hmm. it's the grafting, we mentioned, Chris mentioned grafting. There are people who, 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 who have PhDs in grafting and study grafting for 30 years and have practice of grafting for decades. I and mean, these people really know what they're talking about or almost any other topic that you could think of. So. Your tax dollars pay for these things, use this source of information. It's there available to you and it's an excellent source of information. You could go on the internet and get almost any kind of information you want. And it's not that that's bad, it's just that it may not be the, um, the most um, up-to-date and the most scientifically valid. So go to a good source, something that you could trust, something that's gonna give you good information. It's very helpful. Chris, may right. I say something? It's Suzanne. Sure, go, go right ahead, Suzanne. Um, there were some, you had some, Dennis, your talk was fabulous, very good. And I noticed oh. you had some um, photographs from Debbie Roos, yes. who has the pollinator garden over in Pittsburgh on the main street there, as you come out, um, if you come north of, of the main street. And it is fabulous. She, she, she's there many times to talk to people uh, about what's growing in there. And oh yeah, there you have it, the Chatham Mills Pollinator Garden. Wonderful. <laughs> I thought it was there. Yes, I I had I was on the chat and I it covered it up and I didn't see it. I'm sorry, but that no that's a really good one and it's very close, close yep. by. Okay, well, thank you, thank you so much for that comment. I, thank I you, Suzanne. That. Suzanne's one of our volunteers. Okay. Uh, so we had a question here from Dory. Okay. And uh, Dory asked, is there any um, suggested organic methods for dealing with yellow jackets? So Dennis said that some of the um, bees aren't all that aggressive, but yeah, you're right. yeah. bees certainly have been aggressive towards me. Maybe not you, but uh, well, aggressive towards me. And it's not necessarily organic, but I just put a rock over their hole. Well, okay. Um, <laughs> first off, keep in mind, yellow jackets are, are wasps and hornets. Yes. Okay. They are not bees. They are no. not pollinators. They are they are predators. But they're evil. They, they, they are evil. <laughs> and yes, there is an organic way of doing that. And it's very simple. Um, you want to go, once you know where their nesting site is and where the hole that they're coming out of, typically there's just the one. Yep. You could put a rock on it, but they're tenacious enough. They're just going to dig another hole yep. and come out some other place. So yep. this is what you do. 
You get a five gallon bucket, fill it with ice water, get it very cold and put in a tablespoon or two of dish soap, any dish soap, mm. go out at night, especially if it's cooler at night, take that five gallon bucket of water of ice water, turn it upside down on that hole. Mm. And then ice water is gonna flush all through that nest and get in everywhere inside there. The cold will, will stun them so they don't come flying out to come chasing you. If it's at night, they can't see you. So you wanna dump the thing and get out of there. So don't hang around, leave. And um, most insects breathe through their skin. And so when you cover them with a soapy solution, it's a surfactant. The surfactant covers mm -hmm. up all of the pores and they asphyxiate. So mm -hmm. it's a natural way to, to um, kill yellow jackets without having to use a pesticide. Mm. But uh, do note that some surfactants are actually toxic to plants. So don't be surprised that some of your nearby plants will die. But I'm assuming that's very diluted and yeah, well, may not to have too much well, of an impact. If but, you put one tablespoon to yeah. five gallons, it's, yeah. it's diluted enough that it should, it should work. Yes. Yeah. But normally you want a very quick acting something. Well, that's again, if you're going to look for, for some something that natural and quick. organic, at night, cold water, yeah. you know, that, you know, that might be a better alternative than spraying with the chemical. Yeah. But yes, with all things, you have to be cautious. It's not, it's not the, it's not a be all to end all, but it's a good solution that works a lot of times for, for things like yellow jackets. Cause they are, they are, if you ever stepped on a yellow jacket nest, if you're out picking blueberries or something, they fly up your pant leg and they keep going up and you're dancing around trying to get them to stop stinging you, but uh, you, you don't have a lot of sympathy for them now. Yeah. So I have another question in here from Ruth, and Ruth is asking, what is the correct time in the spring to cut back the grasses? Okay, again, what you wanna do is watch the grasses as they're beginning to start shoot, sending up new growth, okay? Um, so it's pretty obvious when you see them, yeah, everything is brown in your ornamental grass, but then coming from the very center of the plant where the crown is, you'll see new green growth coming up. Once that starts to come up, the plant is gonna be now uh, sending off um, you know, new foliage. And usually by that time, the bees have already hatched, okay? Mm -hmm. So the point is don't take it down in October or November because it's just dead grass and you don't like the way it looks. Actually, I never could quite understand. I think the, the, the ornamental grass, once it turns brown, I to me, it's very attractive, but to other people, it isn't. Okay. Again, very, very attractive. So I never thought about it until just now. What about cutting back the grasses and maybe do it in February or March, which is fairly late, but maybe a little bit too early, and just putting a pile in your backyard for a while? It, and you could do that too, yes. And then put it out in the street right, later exactly. on for the, um, the city to take right. it away. The only issue is depending upon where you put it, and if it gets too much moisture, they may drown. Yeah, I wouldn't put it in big monster piles right. where it's more of a compost right. pile, but just yep. kind of lay them loosely on the ground. And, yep. yep. Yeah. I would think Can that'd I be another fairly another comment? Good Can sure, I make another comment? Sure, Suzanne. I want to go back to the um, the evil yellow jackets. <laughs> okay. Uh, I I when I first moved to my woodland thirty years ago, there were yell there was a yellow jacket where I wanted a pathway, so I I had a company come out and poison them. There were three nests, and that Whoa. year I had the worst aphid infestation because they mm -hmm. will eat aphids. They will also they eat proteins, as you know. And as you're digging around in the dirt, have you ever noticed the yellow jackets come come around looking for the little grubs and things that are in there? And they eat, if we didn't have yellow jackets and wasps, we would be knee deep in debris of dead insects. So yes. what I do, I do is I make a sign and I and I kind of put a big kind of fence around, not a big fence, but a you know a, a, a wide enough fence if it's not in a pathway, and um, just put a sign there, yellow jackets danger, and they're they're on a mission. They're not they don't want to get you unless you disturb their nest. So um, I try to live with them if I can. I hate them, like you say. Yeah. I mean they but keep they keep, they sting sting sting. They 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 have more multiple stings. But anyway, that's my comment. <laughs> and that's a, that's a good comment. I commented earlier that you want to have some sense of balance. You have to have some tolerance for insects. And just be, not all insects are bad, even stinging insects like the dastardly yellow jackets. Indeed, they're, they, they're predators, they eat other insects. 
okay? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so if they're eating up all your aphids, that's a good thing for you. Um, and so that's the, the, the question was, did, did I know of any um, organic way, non-chemical insecticide way of getting rid of them? That's why I answered in that oh, context. Yeah. Yeah, but that I was should have been um, yes. cogent enough to say, now, wait a minute, the other things to do is just avoid them. The problem mm -hmm. is with the yellow jackets, once they get established, they tend to stay there. You know, they're going to be there oh, yeah. for like maybe forever. So the, No, their nests just, will move. Their nests uh, well, move. Well, they, they can move, but they could, they could also stay in one site for quite some time, too. Oh, um, okay. so, um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of like the paper wasps will, will nest in one spot, and then at the end of the season, they're gone. Yeah. So anyway, the point being that if you have plenty of room to say, okay, there's, there's a danger here, avoid this area so you don't get stung. And that's yeah. a perfectly leg legitimate way of, the encounters I've had with um, yellow jackets is when I'm out in the, you know, in the field doing something and I don't know uh -huh. that there's a yellow jacket yeah. and I step on them. Yeah. Or you've yeah. ever been horseback riding and you, you <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's not fun either, um, no. uh, because they'll sting the horses, they'll sting you, and then the horses, uh, you know, they don't, they, they, yeah, it's a problem. So uh. if you're out in the field somewhere, you, you know, just avoid that area. But if it's in your backyard mm -hmm. and you only have, you've got a quarter acre or less and you want to be able to use, utilize that area, then you have to make a decision. Should I preserve the life of these predators that have a benefit to me or do I need to take some other action? Just be mindful before you start killing everything is the point that I don't want to make. If you need to do it, then do it sensibly. <laughs> Thank you. One, that was a wonderful response. Thank you. Yeah. One, one of my uh, nests was right at the um, path going back to the fish pond. Yeah. So we had to take care of that one because it was getting us every time going back there. And my brother lost a lot of trees last year and his biggest tree that fell down was right on the epicenter of a of a nest, so you can imagine how fun it was for him to take down that, uh, or uh, get rid of the tree out of his yard. So <laughs> that was yeah. not fun for him. Just a couple um, of years ago, my sister had a yellow jacket nest right at the base of their entrance way into their back porch. Oh no. <laughs> they couldn't, couldn't walk out the house without That's stepping not good. on the yellow jacket nests. So Eric had a great comment to add to your web searches. He says to add PDF. Oh, to yeah, the, yeah. The there you go. You yeah. quite often Thank get scholarly you. articles in that, yes. in that case. So I thought that was a great one. I, I have heard that one before. Yes. Yeah, a lot of the stuff on that website is in PDF format anyway. But that's, yeah, that's a great comment. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, so a comment for Rodney. Yes, Rodney, our, our timing that we're talking about is here for Central North Carolina. If you live further south or further north, North or even west, your timing might change. Um, our frost free period ends in the uh, middle of April or so, and a lot of our stuff is cut back or so, um, in the middle of March. So yeah, you might need you might need to adjust the, the timing for that. Yes, and that's a good point. So when you're going to log on to various Master Gardener Extension websites, like oh, where you go here, this is for Wake County. Every county has an, um, uh, has an extension office. So if you're in the coastal plains, it's one thing. If you're up in the mountains, that's a different thing. Um, so make sure that the information um, you, are, you are searching for is to your uh, specific location. That's why I commented you might yep. want to put, say, colon EDU space NC. So you're looking at North Carolina. But of course, North Carolina can be subdivided into the various uh, growth zones, too. So here, here's a question we might need the collective pool of everyone here in person and online to answer. Okay. Uh, Patricia is wondering, is there any, does anyone know of any pollinator gardens in Eastern North Carolina, for example, Greenville, Washington, New Bern area? I don't myself specifically, a lot of extension sites do have small gardens that are visible. Yes. They might have a pollinator garden as part of that. Um, well, again, I would suggest you go to the county extension office, yep. do a search for pollinator demonstration garden. Yep. Okay. Um, in that county. <laughs> and you might be able to find something when you're looking for, where'd that go? Not wrong way. These are all basically demonstration gardens. Yes. So those are different ones. I know the right. um, but yeah, those Green, Greenville site down. has a public garden. I just don't know if they have a pollinator garden in there, yep. but I'm sure many other plants attract pollinators. Just yes. a matter of going out there and looking. And I, I added it to the comments earlier, Patricia, and it might be helpful for you. 
one of the nicest trial reports out there. The trial report's done by the Mount Cuba Center. They're a garden that specializes in native plants. Um, it's a fabulous garden. And their uh, trial reports not only uh, look at the health and the beauty of the plants, but they count the number of pollinators on the plants and the different kinds of pollinators that are attracted to the plants. And that's actually written right there in the reports. And they do try, if I'm not mistaken, annuals and perennials. So that could be a very good resource as well. Just Okay, I don't understand Rebecca's thing. Can you do things to avoid attracting them? I'm assuming to attract um, the um, little ground hornets, but I don't know, they just kind of show up. <laughs> yellow jackets? Uh, yeah. Um, oh, she did say yellow jackets. Yeah, I, I think they just show up. Well, again, they're predators. Yeah. So they're going to be going after various kinds of insects, but depending upon the. So if you have mud daubers, mud daubers are going after uh, um, spiders, for yeah. instance. Some of them are very specific as to what what they do, but as far as I know, the yellow jackets are are, are they all eat a whole bunch of insects, yeah. right? Um, so yeah. I, so Suzanne it, mentioned if you dig a hole, they'll be there investigating. If yeah, they're just looking for something to eat, they're right. not looking for that, a hole. Well, that's right. They're yeah. they're there looking for something to eat, just yeah. like the, the pollinators aren't there to pollinate the flowers. They're there looking for something to eat. Yep. Um, it, see, and, and many ants are the same way. I mean, we have all sorts of native ants. Fire ants are not native. Most native ants that are here are here for a reason. There's a an ant called a thief ant or um, something indicating that they're, they're thieves. And I, and I can't recall the exact name, but basically they're the kinds of ants where if you see a little crack in your, in your concrete in your driveway and there's a little itty bitty mound mm -hmm. about the size of a silver dollar or something, there's one here and one there. What those ants do is they go out at night um, and they forage for dead insects all over the place. And they pick them up and they bring them back to the nest to eat them. Now, the other thing that they'll do is really very interesting. They're one of the very few natural predators for fire ants. Nice. Um, so these ants, these native ants are, in terms of their um, uh, evolutionary development, they are pretty well sophisticated ants, fire ants are not, all right? So fire ants don't have the same um, sophistication of pheromones and other sorts of things that this particular species does. And I wish I could think of the name of it, but it's just not coming to me. So what they'll do is when they come across a fire ant, they'll follow it back to its nest, All right? In the moment the fire ant drops whatever it's eating, they run up to it, snatch it and take it away. That's why they call them theft thief ants or something like that. And they'll do that enough so they could start to starve out the fire ant nest, and if the fire ant nest gets weak enough, they'll invade the damn thing and go in there and kill all the fire ants. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people oftentimes will see ants in their yard and want to kill those ants. Yeah. Again, I'm trying to, just because it's an ant and just because it's in your lawn or just because it's in your garden, it, you know, it's, it's the first thing you, you don't want to do is go and kill it. Or th those little um, house ants, uh, sugar ants, um, odorous ants, like they're called. Um, those are native ants, um, and they, they do eat um, carbohydrates, um, and they'll come into your house um, to eat carbohydrates. If you've got breadcrumbs or whatever, you know, on your countertops or whatnot, in the spring, soon they'll be coming, they'll do that. So um, most of those nest in the ground, um, and oftentimes they're nesting um, in areas where you've got mulch, all right? So if, if you have an area where they're coming in, they're coming in through some crack or some opening. Try to find that crack and opening and seal it up. Keep them outside, right? Failing that, if you can't find where they're coming, find where the mulch is and pull back the mulch so that their nesting site's not next to the foundation of your house if they're crawling up. Try to do some things other than just killing them willy-nilly because they're there for a purpose too. So that's, that's, that's my new favorite ant. <laughs> uh, <no>. So one, <laughs> one other thing that people don't think about, and this really isn't about pollinator gardening or anything, but insects like ants and other burrowing uh, insects, they help increase the aeration in soil and water it, penetration yes. and the incorporation of organic matter. So in other exactly. words, good, good, and good. Yes, that's right. So don't kill all your ants. No, don't kill all your insects. <laughs> yes, ma'am, you've got a question? Oh. And I think that they can get in that way as well. Like a lot of windows and 
That's that's correct. Yes. Yeah, I mean, they can be pretty tenacious. And when they find a food source, they're going to exploit it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's a I spent a lot of my time working in gardens and on farms and stuff like it, it, depending upon your background, if you've been exposed to a bunch of bugs, it's just bugs. You don't get that excited about them, right? My wife, on the other hand, you know, the number of times she says, there's a bug in here, do something. You know, it's mm -hmm. okay. It's, I guess I got to do something, right? Um, um, and, and, and that's true. Yes, they can. And that's easily solved. Yes. Cut the plant away from your house. That's right. There you go. Just or or prune it enough. Yeah. So they're not gonna, you know, those itty bitty ants are not gonna be able to traverse a foot. Okay. So you just prune back the branches so it's you don't want to rub it on your house anyway. It's not yeah. a good idea. It's not good for the plants, not good for the house. So prune it back a little bit so the ants can't get there. I mean, that beats trying to kill them once they get inside the house. So we, we had an online comment from Tony. He uh, commented that the New Hanover County Arboretum is a great resource and they have a pollinator section. So not quite Greenville and New Bern and Washington, but eh, a, a, good, a good drive for a visit. Yeah. And uh, so Teresa said the Pitt County Arboretum, um, uh, which I think is the Greenville, the Greenville one, if I'm not mistaken, it has a butterfly garden and a wildflower garden. So great, great for pollinators. So right. thank you, Teresa. I was thinking that they might have one. Right. Transylvania County has a pollinator gardening garden at Silver Mount Park. I'm not familiar with Transylvania County, but there you go. Sure. There's another one. And someone said, uh, what was that name, Chris? I don't know what that one was about, sorry. <laughs> um, if you don't have uh, full sun anywhere in your garden, what can you plant for pollinators? Well, okay. a lot of your spring things yes. get sun in the wintertime, so you can plant those. Yeah, um, your hellebore. Um, yep. Again, if you go to the um, search um, NC State plant toolbox, mm -hmm. And then you're going to be uh, looking for a plant versus identify. Yet you, you, the first thing they're going to is you, you want to identify a plant, or you know you want to you want to um, search for the kind of plant that you want to put in your location. So what plant is this? I don't know what this plant is. It's one way to go. Or hey, I've got this really shaded area, and I want to plant something that'll bloom, right? So what do I do? So on the left hand side, you'll see um, a. Um, uh, shoot, what's the term for something where you're going to apply filter, a filter, right? Yeah. So one of the very first questions they ask is, well, how much sun does it get, right? How much water does it get? What are you going to use the, 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 um, the garden for? And do you want to have something that blooms a lot, okay? For what reason? And I think attracting pollinators is one of the things you could use as a filter. So go through that filter and it'll say, okay, here's some of the kind of plants that you could plant there. That'd be great. Yep. So here's a weird one. Okay. Rodney says or asks, are spiders pollinators? No. Again, Cre creatures that, are diverse, and that, I don't know that, a single one that as, is. That's but. right. As a general rule of thumb, spiders are yeah. they're they're predators. Yeah. Okay, for the most part. Now they may very there are a number of spiders that just hang around flowers. An accidental pollinator. Yeah, there you go. Nests. So they're accidental yeah. pollinators. They're there to <laughs> trap the insect that's coming to pollinate. Yeah. And so they may inadvertently pollinate the plant, but typically, no, they are not pollinators. The, the moment we say no is the yeah, moment yeah, someone can discover a, one that, that is. Right? As a general rule of thumb. <laughs> <laughs> what I know is a job, what I don't know is an ocean. Try to keep that in yeah. mind. Like, like just a little while ago, they thought caterpillars were vegetarians, but they found a few that actually eat other insects. insects yeah. So yeah. you never know what's out there, but yeah, you don't generally typically attract uh, spiders for pollinating your plants, right. but they're fun nonetheless. Oh yeah, yeah, they sure are. Yeah. Whenever I get a spider in the house, I always go through pains to, to catch it without hurting it and take it outside so it could do its you know, spider thing, you know, it's yep. just, it's just a bug, unless it's, you know, a black widow, you know, um, or a recluse spider, then if it's, if it's dangerous, then that's a different story. But Patricia added the comment that the Mount Cuba website looks like it's an amazing resource. It certainly is. She put the link right in there for you, just mountcubacenter.org, excuse me. So Cuba is just like the country. 
Mount Cuba Center. Great, it's a great garden to visit. It was, a, it's a beautiful one. We had one of their uh, trial coordinators, a guest speaker, a couple of years ago at one of our symposia, and oh boy, she is an awesome individual. Very, very informative. Um, uh, Marilyn put the um, la lack of the proper name, the botanical name for the thief ants in, in the chat. Sure. I guess that'd be the animal scientific name. Sure. <laughs> you can tell how much biology I've had. <laughs> <laughs> that goes back to high school. Okay. Uh, there you go. Uh, just looking through. Uh, Vance County has an extension master gardener memorial garden that has a that is a pollinator garden at the Vance County Farmers Market location. So there you go. And I think my uh, chat just flipped back up to the beginning, so that must have um, been the attack of all of them. They're really piling up, but a whole lot of them are just thank yous. You got oh. a whole bunch of those, so thank you, Dennis. Okay. All right. Well, uh, well, you definitely didn't see enough when anyone saw, but we were right at about 100 people online. Wow. So very good audience. Thank you much, everyone, for joining us today. I'm glad you could be here to enjoy a great talk for um, uh, caring for and attracting pollinators to your home garden. And uh, thank you so much, Dennis, for joining us this morning and getting a great presentation. It was certainly very enjoyable and we had a great time. And thank you, of course, to the people that came and joined us in person too. Right. We will hopefully see you all real soon at some upcoming, upcoming programs. Of course, we have the live and in-person plant lovers tour tomorrow going out to the Western um, Arboretum beds. And of course, our midweek program, learning how to sow seeds. And that'll be on Wednesday online for those that live a distance. And uh, just a quick registration online for that one. So we'll see you real soon. Have a great week and enjoy the beautiful weather that we have coming here at the Arboretum. And by the way, if you like magnolias and live nearby, it's magnolia season here at the Arboretum. Hope to see you real soon. Bye, everyone.